Welcome to Highly Respected with Scott Greer. I'm your host, Scott Greer. This is the very first episode of my podcast, and I will be going solo. So I hope you enjoy that. Highly Respected will explore the latest current events, cultural trends, history, and intellectual currents. But first, I need to explain where the title comes from. I mean, why would you call this Highly Respected? I mean, but to longtime followers, it shouldn't be a mystery. I am the Daily Caller's most respected alumnus. Just ask Wikipedia and Eric Owens. I'm also an award-winning journalist. For real. I won the Novak Fellowship, which goes to promising young conservative writers. And I am a promising young conservative writer. Some may even say I'm just a humble campus conservative. But some things came up, and I was not able to keep that award. But I did win it. My podcast will also offer the only the most elite and respectable takes imaginable. Highly respected is a fitting name. Well, you will not believe, never for a minute, what I'm going to talk about today. Yes, shocker, the first episode will be about the coronavirus. It's pretty much the only news item in the world, so we're going to have the first episode about it. I will discuss Trump's response to the crisis, the promise of neat bucks, or rather Trump bucks, the Democrats' response, China, and the neat world order. If you've turned on cable news at any point in the last few weeks, you've heard that Cheeto Man is entirely responsible for the coronavirus. If we only had Hillary Clinton in charge, this wouldn't even be an issue. She would have magically solved it. It is true that Trump should have taken the virus more seriously in February and not said it's just the flu. The boomer moments were stupid and made him look like a fool. And the one encouraging him to say it's just the flu was none other than Jared Kushner. Jared Kushner, once again, upholding his reputation to be the master of bad takes in the White House. But Trump did do a few good things over the last few months. He did put travel restrictions on China back in January. At that time, the media called the action xenophobic and racist. Every big outlet, New York Times, Washington Post, BuzzFeed, was running stories about how the flu was worse than the coronavirus. These same outlets, along with Democrats, complained about Trump's response. We would be in a much worse situation without those restrictions. So if journalists and Democrats had had their way, we'd be much worse off. Despite his errors, the president is doing a good job right now. He's closed the borders to Mexico and Canada. He shut down all travel to and from Europe. He paused refugee admissions and a few other immigration restrictions as well. It's harder to get here now. He's attacking China, the real culprit behind coronavirus nonstop. More on that later. He's also dunking on journalists at his press conference, press conferences rather. On Friday, NBC NBC reporter Peter Alexander asked Trump the question, what do you say to Americans who are watching you right now, who are scared? Trump, in response, called him a terrible reporter, which inspired Alexander to literally clutch his pearls. Unfortunately, this is an audio podcast, so I can't show you the motion of what Peter Alexander did, but you should really look it up. It's hilarious. Trump also pwned journalists who asked him to stop calling it the Chinese virus and disavow an anonymous staffer of his who called it the Kung Flu. Because, of course, the most important thing in a pandemic is to find out Who dared call it the Kung Flu? It's great to see glimmers of 2016 Trump, rather. But outside of dunking on reporters, he is taking the problem seriously, and he's trying his best to present a resolute face to to a worried public. Trump blames China and refuses to think Kung Flu is racist. He's also restricting immigration at a time when everyone told him that he shouldn't do that. That's really racist and xenophobic. So, overall, right now, his job performance is pretty good. Now, Trump has a great idea to offset the negative effects, particularly economic effects, that average Americans are going to feel from coronavirus. He's offering Trump bucks. Trump's temporary UBI plan is shaking up the political paradigm as we know it. He wants to give every American at least $1,000 a month to offset the disruption wrecked by the Wuhan flu. Who would have thought a Republican would have embraced an allegedly socialist idea? 
Now, I won't get into the Knott's Bowl memes on this episode, so sorry to any listeners who are hoping for that. This plan is pretty clear-cut. It'll help out all Americans who are struggling big time right now. It's rare to meet a person who hasn't been hurt by the outbreak. Even professional Twitter posters are feeling the pain. Trump's plan would help ordinary people out, a bailout for America, you would say, and would help alleviate the virus's effects on the economy. It would also help Trump's chances for re-election. But Congressional Republicans or Republicans are trying to screw it up. They want to means test it and make it a tax write-off. This isn't the UBI needs were promised. The new Senate bill is hated by pretty much everybody, according to the Washington Post. Democrats hate it because it doesn't do enough to help the poor. True cons hate it because it's big government. The Trump admin doesn't like it because it isn't the simple plan that helps everybody out that they originally promised. The Senate bill will likely and hopefully be changed to reflect Trump's original intent. We all deserve Trump bucks. This plan should be as simple and as clear as possible. Give it everyone $1,000 a month, regardless of income or whatever. It would be a direct thing to do and lead to fewer shenanigans. The American people would understand the power of a check arriving once a month. Making it a tax write-off based on their 2018 income is weak and likely to piss people off. Send out the checks. Trump is outflanking the Democrats right now. Chuck Schumer and others are some of the folks demanding mean testing the payouts and trying to get Trump to not go full national populist. Bernie Sanders didn't come out front with the 1K idea. Mitt Romney did. Imagine that. Bernie is now playing catch-up as he tries to avoid another humiliating defeat in the Democratic primary. Democrats are showing no alternatives and no leadership in this fight. Well, besides blaming Trump for coronavirus and saying it's racist to call the threat Chinese. Joe Biden. Remember Joe? We haven't seen Joe in a while. Where is Joe? Anyway... He's the all-but-guaranteed party nominee, and he's missing in action. No one can find him. He's not showing his face on TV or anywhere. He has had a few public appearances, but they've all been embarrassing. Last week, or actually a little over a week ago, Biden did a disastrous town hall where tech issues prevented him from being shown on time. Then Joe appeared for a few minutes before walking off the stage, phone in hand, appearing to not know where the hell he was. The last debate featured two boring old men who couldn't remember the name of the coronavirus. Bernie called it Ebola. Biden called it SARS. What an inspiring message to deliver to the American people in the time of a pandemic. On the last primary night, Biden celebrated his victory on an empty stage and appeared to forget where he was once again. His wife had to come on screen and help him off. Remember, it's a conspiracy theory to say this man suffers from any mental decline. No one is in better mental condition than Joe Biden. Now, Biden did recently do a press call with reporters where he expressed amazement at the idea that we can now have telecommunicated conferences. And he also offered a hilariously lame rebuttal to Trump. Joe told Trump to just stop lying about yourself to make yourself a hero. Well, that's an interesting claim for Joe Biden to make. Remember the time he he claimed he was arrested in South Africa trying to visit Nelson Mandela? That didn't happen at all. His hilariously fake story was done to make himself look like a hero. Similar to the corn pop story, as we all know. To reiterate, Trump may not be ideal as a pandemic president. I mean, he's not the ideal president to pretty much anyone, maybe except with the exception of Bill Mitchell. But the alternatives are far worse. Every Democrat would have kept their borders open up until about a week ago. Just look at Justin Trudeau in Canada. Trudeau only decided to seal Canada's border at the last possible moment and was prior to that saying the whole world can come in and making sure there was a direct line to China. Imagine if he had shut down the borders earlier. Or imagine, even worse, if Hillary Clinton was in charge of our borders. She would have done the same thing as Trudeau and other liberal leaders and issued multiple lectures about how the real threat is anti-Asian prejudice and blaming China for the whole disaster.
There's a wide gulf between media perception and public perception of Trump's coronavirus performance. The president's approval ratings for his crisis response stands at 56% in the latest poll. That's incredible when you think that the major newspapers and cable outlets blame the entire crisis on him and lay every single dead American at his feet. Trump was limited what he could do before. The testing shortage is due to a lot of factors outside of his control, mainly that most of the tests are produced in China and they're not trying to and they really are trying to hog all the tests and not give it out to us. The supply shortage of face masks and other critical supplies is the same issue. It's due to a dependence on China, and this was caused by globalism, not by President Trump being elected. We can blame the president for being flippant and focusing way too much on the stock market and the economy. But globalism brought this threat to our shores, and China allowed to get it out of hand. Now, these are two threats Trump has warned about for years. And he's not responsible for globalism or Chinese influence over the West, as I previously mentioned. He should work to negate these nefarious developments and make America more nationalist. That's what made him win in 2016 and what will secure him re-election in 2020. Now, Libs insists that we should have let the experts take charge. And, well, Trump is allowing experts to take charge. I mean, look at Dr. Fauci and others who are on stage with him. But they, that's not necessarily the people they want in charge. They want people like the World Health Organization. However, the World Health Organization was airing Chinese propaganda that everything was under control and there was no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission in mid-January. This is when we were supposed to be able to do something. And here are the experts lying to us and carrying along Chinese propaganda. These same experts were deploring sensible immigration controls as well. They said they didn't work. No travel ban works. Then why the hell is the whole world implementing travel bans right now? The dictates of globalism must always be upheld, even when common sense tells you it's idiotic. Russia was one of the few countries to not fall for the stupid advice of these globalist experts. The motherland shut down its borders in January, and Russia has hardly been hurt by the virus, especially compared to Western Europe. Nationalism is the best cure against the ills of globalism. Now we finally come to the topic of China. There are a couple different issues with China. One, do they deserve the blame for the outbreak? Yes. For several weeks, Chinese officials tried to downplay the virus and suppress whistleblowers even letting a few of them die from coronavirus. When the Chinese had the opportunity to nip the spread of coronavirus, they chose to lie about it. The disease likely found its first carriers through Wuhan's wet markets, which sell live animals for human consumption. Uh, unfortunately, some of my listeners may have even seen some of these clips of what type of animals they may sell at these wet markets. It's pretty disgusting, and I don't recommend people watching it. And this disgusting practice also likely caused the SARS outbreak. China shut down the, these markets after that last outbreak, it, outbreak, but reopened them shortly after the last epidemic. China's increased growth and the frequent travel of its citizens allowed the disease to quickly spread worldwide. Globalism may take the greater blame for the spread, but China benefits immensely from globalism. We can blame both of these factors at the same time. It's not a crazy thing to do. It's not impossible either. Two things can be responsible for such a crisis that we experience right now. Our supply problems, as I previously mentioned, is to be blamed on China. Yes, globalism sent our manufacturing there, but our current Republican president isn't responsible for that and has warned about this for over 30 years. So if you wanted to blame anybody, it would be China and globalism. Now, some on right-wing Twitter have decided that China needs their support. They bravely venture out, exchanging Iranian flags for Chinese ones, and shriek at anyone who dares say anything bad about the Han supremacist state. This stance makes no sense. Some of these sinophilic right-wingers imagine that a Chinese global order would be better for Western nationalists. If the Chinese took over, they would back right-wing extremists and put them in charge. We would have a traditional estate now. Oorah! 
That's ridiculous. Plainly ridiculous. China doesn't care about the right. China probably hates, actually, it's not a probably. They hate the Western right. They prefer idiotic leftists who still think that they are a Maoist state. They're not. It's a Han supremacist state. China already has powerful allies in the West. They have the allegiance of big tech, nearly all major corporations, and yes, even Hollywood. Most sport leagues do everything possible to placate China. Remember what happened when the manager of the Houston Rockets tweeted just one tweet, one measly tweet in support of the Hong Kong protests? China nearly banned the entire NBA from the whole nation over just this one tweet. And what did the NBA do in response? Did it stand up for the freedom of speech? Absolutely not. The NBA and all its major stars bent the knee to please the Chinese. It was pathetic. And many of these same people hold their fists up at high and, and denounce e the evils of America. Yet when it comes to China, they shut up and say thank you. Sad. Our elites and corporations bow before Beijing. If this Chinese somehow did take over America, they would put Mark Zuckerberg in charge. Sorry any right-wingers who are hoping to become the Lord Imperial Governor for the People's Republic of China in a People's Republic of China-controlled America. The Chinese would also treat whites about the same they treat the Uyghurs, especially if they saw us a threat in their future communist-controlled America. This is not something to envy or to want. China may be ruled by ethno-nationalists who want to advance their own people's interests throughout the entire world. That does not mean they will support other nationalists. In fact, they're more likely to see Western nationalists as a major threat to them, unlike the co compliant Western CEOs who come begging to Beijing. On top of the China blame, there are Asian American claims that all this China virus talk is leading to racial oppression. I'm not exaggerating here, but this may be the best news in Asian American history. Asians are finally suffering racism in America. And this is allegedly, I don't buy these claims, but more on that in a second. Asian Americans are the wealthiest, most well-educated racial group in America. The only opportunities denied them are entry to Ivy League schools, which is more of a testament to their success than their oppression. Whites are also denied entry to Ivy League schools on the basis of their race. The most ex prejudice that Asians experience are kids in school slanting their eyes and doing a mock Asian accent. Sure, it's rude, but it's not oppression. Eight, all these Asian students can go back home to their big house and well-off parents and know their situation is likely better than their schoolhouse tormentors. Asian privilege often excludes them from the great POC coalition. Blacks are not about to take Asian claims of racism seriously. Interestingly, many of the hate crimes committed against Asians in the wake of coronavirus have been committed by blacks. Imagine that. There was a black man on a New York train who sprayed Febreze all over an Asian passenger over concerns that he was going to spread the disease everywhere. There was a 20-year-old black man in San Francisco who was charged with a hate crime for beating an elderly Asian woman. And then, surprise, surprise, Saul's charges dropped as part of San Fran's restorative justice program. That's America in 2020. Additionally, a gang of black youths beat Asian passengers on a Philly train a few days ago. A viral video from this weekend shows a black man knocking out an Asian male for laughs. The real threat to Asians appear to be other POC, not whites. But with all the coronavirus developments in Americans, not without cause, suspecting Asians of carrying a lethal virus, Asians can now declare themselves as proud members of the POC coalition. Ignore their big houses and fancy degrees. They're just like blacks in all of their oppression. The oppressed must unite against the oppressors. And the oppressors, of course, are the evil white men who built America. But I don't think this strategy will work. It will make for a funny experiment, however. Asians desperately want to portray themselves as victims so they can receive the benefits owed to the victims in our society. 
Everybody in America now wants to be a victim. That's how you gain moral status. You don't gain moral status by succeeding in America or contributing towards its greatness. You only claim it or gain it by claiming how horribly America treated you. We have finally reached the final segment of the show. And in this segment, I want to talk about the neat world order and how normies, particularly cel celebrities, even though celebrities aren't necessarily normies, but they're in their own category. Anyway, enough digression. How everyone is struggling in this new neat world order. It's only been a few days of quarantine, yet celebrities are melting down. Gal Gadot posted a horrific rendition of her and other celebrities singing John Lennon's Imagine, the globalist anthem. Imagine no countries, no wars, just dumb celebrities sitting in their mansions singing off tune to you. Yuck! Now, I'm going to call for a really good solution here. Trump should order the total and complete shutdown of singing Imagine. This song is musical terrorism, and it's completely un-American. John Lennon sucks, and no one should be inspired by this stupid song. It was terrible in the 1970s. It's been terrible for almost 50 years. It's time to stop singing Imagine. I just had to get that off my chest. Now other celebrities are doing things that are even worse. Celebrities such as Josh Gad and Ellen DeGeneres have posted videos of themselves looking emotionally distraught. Josh Gad even told us that it's okay to cry after his third day of quarantine. I hope he survives for another two weeks. We might, this thing might go on for a long time. Singer Sam Smith offered play-by-play -play pictures of his descent into emotional turmoil. Madonna got into a bathtub for some reason and offered the most bizarre message of hope I've ever witnessed. It's like they think they're in prison camps. Celebrities are definitely not having a normal one. But this further gives credence that Neats will inherit this world created by the quarantine. I do pity nor normie sports fans who have nothing to watch or follow while they're forced to stay at home. All sports are canceled. Maybe they can entertain themselves with the 2006 World Series replay. Try to watch old clips of Kobe Bryant. Maybe they can endlessly talk about Tom Brady leaving the Patriots. The Normies can't really leave their home to play sports either. It's a tough life out there. Unless you're neat. You were born for this world. You've been forced to be by yourself for years. Sitting at home, playing video games 24-7, eating chicken tendies, and making someone else go out and get supplies for you. It's now your world, Neats, and we're all just living in it. God help the normies if this quarantine lasts much longer. Well, that is it for the very first episode of Highly Respected. I know you enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed it. You definitely thought this was the greatest podcast you ever listened to. I know, I can understand the feeling. But join me again next week. The next episode won't just be me talking to myself. I will have a guest on to share my hot takes with. Until next time, stay respected.